We are very sorry for those technical difficulties, guys, but hope everybody's having a good night. We are very excited to have Alex Racino back on The Unfiltered. If you remember, he's been on before, but he's got a new book to talk about today, and we're going to get into all that fun stuff. But I wanted to start it out with an apology for being five minutes behind. We had some technical difficulties. Again, really reassuring the reason why we study history and not technology. That's it there. Well, Alex, <laughs> welcome back, man. It's good to have you back here. Yeah, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Absolutely. It's, I can't remember when when was it that I was on it. Was it two years ago or something like that? There, Maryland was new. <laughs> there, Maryland. Yeah. Okay. There, yeah. There, Maryland was new. So that that was then. I, that must have been what two years ago now. God. Yeah, something like that. I was November still working in DC. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yep. Oh, what a what a lifetime ago. And Anthony's <laughs> there somewhere. He has an A for his face today. I hope that'll help. That changes soon. I'll go to a J at some point. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully. It will. It will. I need to fix my camera. 10 for Well, Alex, for those that may not have met you before, I want to give you a second to go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell us about yourself, how you got into this field. We'll start from there and then we'll dive into the fun stuff. But please take it away. Um, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Um, so my name is Alex Rossino. I have a PhD in history from Syracuse University. I've been a historian, um, not working as an historian. This is really more my hobby now or a second job. Um, but I uh, worked as an historian for several years at the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. Um, studying European history actually was my first. That's my area of expertise from the beginning for my degree and stuff, although I did a lot of uh, American history study, too. Um, and then about 2011, I... Uh, uh, married a woman from Sharpsburg, uh, Maryland, mm. and uh, ended up moving up to Maryland here to be closer to her family. And it just kind of rekindled that love of the Civil War, you know, interest in the Civil War history for me. And ever since then, it's been, I've been sort of intensively studying it and writing about it. I've published a number of things on it now, both fiction and nonfiction. Um, more nonfiction nowadays, but there's uh, there's some fiction out there too, and there's more coming out as well. Yeah, and your fiction was actually what um, had me first read your work. Uh, was uh, Guns of September was the first one that I read. Six Days in September was the first one. Six Guns days, of September six... is the one that's just Sorry, okay, finished okay. up now. That's right. Six Days in yeah. September is the first one. All right. And that was an awesome book to read. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. And it then... was a real challenge for me. I mean, I, the one of the reasons I did it is I've never – I had never written any fiction before. And mm -hmm. for anybody who's done any kind of writing, uh, fiction is a completely different form of writing than history. Although sure. a lot of history that you read is fiction, <laughs> uh, if I could say that. Um, but, uh, you know, yeah, the way it's, the way it's written, um, they tend to be kind of different. So, uh, it, you, you have a different, your, 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 your reason for writing is different, right? So you're trying to get into the heads of the people who are, uh, you're writing about or the characters and things. And, uh, that's kind of different than, you know, history where you have to depend on just the sources. Sure. No, absolutely. Now, um, we have two books, um, and I was finally able to grab both of them from you. Uh, but the first one, I really, really enjoyed the tale untwisted that that was an awesome read. And, um, we're, yeah, it, we're here today to talk about calamity at Frederick and what, what really started that? Like, how did you get into special orders 191? Was that something that you got when you first started writing about Antietam when it came to the fiction? Did that kind of show come to you there? Yeah. So I, I think I mentioned in the introduction or the preface to that book that mm -hmm. to calamity at Frederick that I never intended to write about special orders number 191 simply because there had been so much written about it over the years. And uh, I didn't think there was anything new that, you know, necessarily could be found uh, about it or learned about it. But what I was doing is I was trying to um, learn more about the Army of Northern Virginia's first few days in Maryland. And uh, when it crossed over the Potomac River, the order it crossed in, the order of the, the route of march that it took, um, and then finally the encampments, because when you go visit the best farm in Frederick, which is now Monocacy National Battlefield, mm -hmm. um, you you see that you're know, like well, this can't possibly have held an entire army this area it's just too small um and so i started to do some looking around to try and determine exactly where different commands camped dh hill's command uh jackson's command etc and i found that lo and behold dh hill there's no evidence for dh hill camping anywhere near frederick city as a matter of fact there was um there was uh 
mention AQ. I'm going to get you. <laughs> <laughs> already starting out with that. Yeah, already, already, already taking the piss. Um, so, <laughs> so, <I'm bearing> <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but anyway, I still, so when I, well, that sort of got me interested because I was like, hold on a second. The only evidence that exists for where DHL camp puts him four and a half miles from the four miles in the opposite direction from where the orders were found, even if you don't use my specific site, but just right. the area, the general area where the orders were found. And so that kind of set me off thinking, wow, this is there's something here. And then we started, Gene and Thorpe and I started working on the tail and twisted and he had all this material and that he was, that, that he helped me with um, some background for uh, the guns of September because mm -hmm. the guns of September is McClellan and his army for the last six days of the Maryland campaign. So right. um, that starts on the 12th. And so um, that I had to deal with the, the lost order situation because I wanted to make sure that I got the history right in the events. And Gene said, no one's got the history or the events right. We need to we need to put this out, mm. and uh, so that's that set me down that road. And then as that started out as an essay with Savis Beatty. Sorry for the long answer here. No, this is perfect. Um, Good. That started with it as a digital essay with Savis Beatty uh, that came out in 2019, and we were doing some talks about it, virtual presentations, and then we did, we also spoke to the Frederick Civil War Roundtable, and we kept on getting questions about well we really like a hard copy. Um, you know, is there any way we can, we can get one of those and we didn't have one. So we decided we were going to expand it into a book. That's what ended up being published in January of this year. Mm -hmm. And then we also got questions like, where were the orders found? Who lost the orders? All of those questions, you know, the detailed questions about the Confederate side of the story. And I had no good answer to any of those questions. So I realized, well, maybe I better get in on that, get on this and start doing some research on it and figure out if I could, if there was something to add there. Uh, and sure enough, there was more than I could have dreamed to add. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you've got two healthy volumes out now on the subject matter, which is incredible to have. And I think, you know, we haven't ever really seen a full length treatment on special orders 191. Yeah. Not on the orders themselves. It's really no. been an essay here or there or a part of a book or, you know, something like that. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things in history that I don't want to say it gets glossed over because it's a very important aspect mm -hmm. of the, the Maryland campaign of 62. But yep. this, this is also something I think that does deserve the attention. And I'm so glad that you were able to bring that to light. Thanks. Um, and yeah, reading through this, I'm, I'm finishing up right now Calamity of Frederick. Uh, and I, like I said, I got through Tale Untwisted. I had a, I realized I had a digital copy for the bookstore and that we're working on that, um, making that happen too. Because that, that's a very important topic for any Civil War site uh, to read. Great. Yeah, but one thing I found really interesting in looking over um, Gene Thorpe, uh, there was a little attache that you guys had. Tell me a little bit about the Special Orders 191 that came with the book. Was that something you guys did for No, that was Ted Savas's idea. Yeah, that Ted was Savis, awesome. He's like, I gotta, he's like here, let's put a little little copy of the Lost Orders in there. You guys can sign there. And uh, so that's what we do. <laughs> I have one <laughs> copy left with that insert in it. And that's you it. really <laughs> Awesome. No, that was so cool to see. That was a surprise. I opened it up. I'm like, oh my God, I found the lost orders. Like, whoa. <laughs> uh, and AQ is coming saying the tale untwisted was well done and really gave reason to rethink McClellan overall. Yeah. Thanks. Ooh. Thank you. I appreciate it. That was really the goal of the book um, because the history of McClellan has been written from the perspective of, well, the history of McClellan's performance during the civil war has been written from the perspective of Lincolnites. And that means that it's automatically negative. And so yeah. there's a lot of uh, truth there or a lot of reality there that's been glossed over or been misrepresented. And so we wanted to, you know, correct correct that part of the history. Uh, Gene has, un unfortunately, he's an incredibly busy, he's the busiest person I've ever met. I thought used to think Ted was the busiest person I ever met, but Gene <laughs> is literally the busiest person I've ever met. And he's sure. got three studies in flight. One of them is on the Peninsula campaign. One of them is on mm. uh, the Army of Northern Virginia's actual numbers uh, from the Peninsula campaign all the way through Antietam. And then the third one is a, uh, a history of um, the Maryland campaign too. Okay. So he's got all this, he's got all this stuff going. <laughs> Jack of all trades. Mm -hmm. um, that brings up a question when AQ asks you or says that uh, it gave reasons to rethink McClellan overall. In all of your research, did you go in with an opinion of McClellan and come out with a different? Uh, so that's interesting. Um, I I try and remain as objective as possible simply because my job as a historian is to um, look at the evidence and then 
you know, tell will tell the story as the evidence presents itself to right. me, not to judge, uh, you know, individuals if I can help it, um, because I find that that doesn't really help very much. That's what the Internet's good for. You know, you can get in arguments with people about doing that. Absolutely. stuff. But when you're publishing history, you know, I try and make sure that I like, stay as objective as possible. And so. I'd say that I wanted to know more about George McClellan. Um, I still don't think that his performance at Antietam was necessarily as good as it could have been. Sure. Um, sure. But oh, yeah. so I'm, and Gene and I disagree on that and that's fine. We don't agree on a lot of things, <laughs> um, but uh, there, but I do think that um, after looking at the evidence, I couldn't help but realize that his performance during the Maryland campaign as a whole uh, was definitely better than has been portrayed uh, and depicted. So um, I didn't come in, I'd say, with a hard. I came in with the usual bias that most people have because the mm -hmm. only things you ever read about McClellan are terrible. But um, but I did. I had been exposed to a couple of things that um, had started to make me question that narrative. One of them being Joseph Harsh's book, Taken at the Flood, um, where he gives McClellan more credit than uh, than others do for having success during the campaign. And the other one is uh, Ethan Raffuse's uh, McClellan's War, mm -hmm. which um, was uh, definitely more even handed as well. So between, you know, with those two, the sort of edifice of my, my bi any bias I might have had about mcclellan or against mcclellan had started to break down and crack already yeah now another thing too so from my understanding of 191 even before reading tale untwisted is that this copy was obviously going to dho that, mm -hmm. that's my understanding of it now is this a second copy dho is supposedly receiving an order already is this a second copy of 191 that is lost or is this the order that was meant for dh hill so that's a good question. Uh, I cannot answer whether or not this was the copy that was meant for D.H. Hill. Um, I do suspect that it wasn't, however, and I'll give you a couple of reasons why. So sure. let's step back for a second here mm -hmm. and explain the command situation in the Army of Northern Virginia at the time um, up until uh, the 10th of September. So the morning that the Army starts to move out from Frederick, right, toward, toward Hagerstown. Um, the, the moment that that happens, then uh, D.H. Hill is is no longer under Stonewall Jackson's command. Right. But up until that point, D.H. Hill has been or was under Stonewall Jackson's command. So when the orders were issued by headquarters, um, one, a copy, of course, went to Jackson and a copy went to um, went to Longstreet. Uh, and so as the you know, as these wing commanders for the Army of Northern Virginia. Right. Um, so Jackson then, of course, made a copy for Hill because Hill was still under his command at that point. Mm -hmm. Um, so that and that's the copy that Hill had for the rest kept for the rest of his life and also that you can see online it's available online you can look at it at the University of North Carolina's uh, library's website you can see it there copy of that um, so another copy was apparently made for Hill at Army headquarters uh, uh, by um, uh, uh, What's his name? Uh, Major Richard Cornelius Taylor who was Walter Taylor's older brother okay and he was the copyist. Um, and so he apparently made a copy of that of the order and that part that order I have no evidence that that order was ever sent or that copy was ever sent to DH Hill he swore for the rest of his life that he never received um, another copy of the order um, so the copy that ends up being lost the the, the problem is is that um, that copy is not in the handwriting, and this is after months of analysis that I did of the handwriting of um, these different individuals. And there's a supplement to Calamity of Frederick coming out as an ebook. So I have a speed, he's oh, got cool. it right now, where it's over 100 pages of my analysis, the words that I chose, that I picked, and from different documents from seven different individuals and compared to see if I could figure out who it was who actually wrote this thing. Huh. Um, because it's not Robert Chilton's handwriting, um, and it's almost not, certainly not major richard cornelius taylor's handwriting either um so whose handwriting is it right yeah it's got to um, be somebody's yeah right so so when i when i came to the conclusion that the order was actually probably written by armistead long who was lee's military secretary that tells me that it was probably a copy of the copy that um uh that taylor had already made and was lying there and was uh was the only one that hadn't been sent out Okay. So because it was it was the only one who hadn't been said hadn't been sent out when the copy was made for uh, whoever lost it, um, it was made by Long and uh, at 
either a general lee's request or the request of the recipient um and so that's what i think happened with the you know with with that so there's okay. some evidence that it was it was written for dh that the copy was written for dhl but this is actually a copy of a copy hmm. oh that's and that's kind of what i was under the impression of i have an off the wall question is it two or three cigars <laughs> it's two cigars <laughs> it's two. okay i have and seen and mitchell got one of them <laughs> oh he did he did yeah okay <laughs> so I, I was reading something today on monocacy actually and this is really from what i'm hearing from you now already is making me really reconsider even wanting to read this again because I, the, the guy that wrote this monocacy book a claimed that jeb stewart was the reason this order gets copied and sent which which, it, book? which book this is called a desperate engagement Hmm. Oh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know that book. You don't need to. <laughs> it's not <laughs> from what I'm seeing right now. I'm like, oh, God. Um, so I knew that that already caught my eye. I'm like, this isn't right. The oh. second thing I noticed found with three cigars. And I was like, oh, yeah. Right. That's the well, second the, time the I've Antietam, seen that. The old Antietam Park movie says found wrapped around three cigars. That's that's right. Exactly. James Earl Jones says it. Just okay. Give me a Just give me a quick second. I got to turn fine. the heat down in this room. Hold on. No, take your time. You're good. <clears throat> Anthony highly recommends Destiny. <clears throat> James Earl Jones. <laughs> a special order. That movie, that movie a new, a new um, version of that movie is being re uh, redone. So uh, I'm excited it'll to be see more. It. It'll be more accurate than that one is. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I would hope so. But yeah, that was a funny thing. I knew I was like, I'm going to ask Alex tonight because for some reason, three, I don't remember reading that anywhere else. And I know I've seen it somewhere too, where it said three. And I'm just like, I don't think there were three cigars. Not that that would really change it, what the outcome of <laughs> and the importance of 191, but it's a part of the story. It's a little So different. it's kind of interesting. People are really obsessed with the cigar issue. We get the question constantly. <laughs> they always want to know how many cigars there are and stuff. And I find it really bizarre that that that's the most important thing to some to some folks, you know, when they yeah. were in the story. But the cigars <laughs> are important because right. to me, what they tell me is that the person who was carrying them was the person who was intended to have the order or was already get, was given a copy of the order. It was not a courier. Yeah, because you're that's not going to give it. Me. And that's, that's a really good point. You know, I didn't even think about that, but you're right. A, a standard courier isn't going to be gifted cigars. Like, mm -hmm. who knows the quality of them? It could be like the lowest tobacco in the world, or it could be some really good. It, it doesn't matter. No right. cigars went to anybody. They didn't go to McClaws. They didn't go to Long Street. They didn't go to Jackson. They didn't go to Walker. I mean, okay, so they didn't get cigars, and they're, they outranked AHL, some of them. So, yeah. you know, why, why would why they get cigars? <laughs> that's an age old mystery. <laughs> question we never know. All right, Why so, is it that cigar? <laughs> I like that. That that shows there is some importance to that. So it's not just there, a, there is. Yeah, yeah, that's actually really cool. Yeah. So, and then shifting to calamity for a minute, did that start in conjunction with Tail Untwisted? Was that something you were working on simultaneously, or was that something like immediately after Tail Untwisted? You're just like, I've got to work on this now. I'm so, really going. so I wasn't working on Calamity. No, it was something that um, I had been collecting documents for um, mm -hmm. because I had been thinking about doing something. Really, what I was trying to do is educate myself about the Lost Orders and their history and their generation and all these things. Um, but I didn't have in mind that I was going to be writing something necessarily about it until after Tail Untwisted that came out and then we really started to get the questions and i was like oh boy i better i better get on this so um i started writing it in well i had started writing pieces of it earlier than uh than january of this pat this year um but i hadn't really started getting into uh really writing on writing it constantly to finish mm -hmm. with the idea of finishing a book until probably march or april uh, of this year. Uh, so it went pretty fast after that. It's not a long book, um, but you know, a couple hundred pages and stuff. Yeah. Um, but you know, the thing that one of the, th the, the book is really a, a, um, a sort of a, 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 a joining of a number of different projects that were going on in my mind at the time and not in, uh, in my, in my world at the time. And one of them really was, I wanted to know in detail what, um, Robert E. Lee's schedule was and what the, what the, what the sort of sequence of events was, uh, during the army's, um, time in Frederick. Okay. Because I had been doing a lot of work about that already. And then, uh, uh, Charlie Knight's book, um, Robert E. Lee Day by Day, you know, the he, he put that out. Um, and uh, I was noticing some 
I was noticing some discrepancies again in what I was really? finding versus what he was finding. Yeah. Well, because he used secondary sources for the most part, you know, mm -hmm. and so you're relying on other people who have gotten it right in the first place and they rarely haven't gotten it go this way yeah, they really yeah. haven't gotten it right um you know <laughs> they i really didn't mean for that to block right. you sorry um, about that that's okay no problem um but they but there are there are certain things about the sequence of events that they really hadn't gotten right so i had all that written already all the notes and stuff for that were written already um and i had all the sources lined up and stuff so the parts that i ended up having to work on or working on more intensively for calamity were determining where the orders were found um, writing up the material I had gotten, I had to, uh, um, collected from the documents, different documents that I was finding from the Library of Virginia and uh, Virginia Museum of History in North Carolina and a, a lot of different University of Virginia, a lot of different places. Um, and then the last part, the um, last part was uh, who lost the orders, my kind of analysis of who lost the orders. Um, and I already had that essay that's at the end, which mm -hmm. is um, the the impact of the loss of the orders on Confederate operations. I had had that. That was that has been done for over a year already. Um, oh, wow. By that point in time, and um, so I realized I had all these pieces, and I'm like, oh, pull this together, pull this together, pull that together, and it becomes you know one one study from there. Awesome. Uh, AQ is asking a pretty good question, and I'm, I'm really fond of this one. If you can pick which book in your writing career is the one you're most proud of and why? That's a good question. That's a really good question. Um, boy, for different reasons, too. I mean, I'm really proud of Six Days in September because I, I was really surprised at how well received it was mm -hmm. um or it has been for someone who's never written on for never written fiction before so that was really really I something that book by the way um and then uh i would say that um the my the from writing six days in september it made me a better historian a better writer as an historian and so they're tail and twisted i think the writing in that i i'm really proud of the way that that came together um too uh and then you know calamity has ended up being um ended up being far more polished than i than anything i'd ever produced so i'm really, really proud of the way that came out too yeah i just i went over it and over and over and over and over again because to me there was really these are really important issues to a lot of people and i want to make sure that i get my representation of them correct you know sure. um so i'm i'm pretty i'd say you know what i think i like to think my work gets better as i go on so i would say that uh calamity and frederick i'm the most proud of that one let's just pick up pick a lane and stick there and i'm going to time travel for a minute your first book isn't even civil war right no that's is it world war ii yeah my first book is called hitler strikes poland it was published in 20 or 2003 uh it was about the racial and political policies that were implemented by the german uh occupying forces against poles and Ooh. polish jews uh during the polish campaign which is about uh you know a month-long campaign and in, in, again in september for i end up writing about these september <laughs> military things i don't know why um but again in september um and my purpose for that book was really to show that the escalation of violence that occurred at this in the Soviet Union in 1941 with the um, mass extermination of uh, of um, Jewish civilians behind this behind the front and stuff and the the uh, mass murder of uh, POWs that the the sort of impetus or the 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 push for that kind of violence started in 1939. Hmm. Um, to show that it that there was a continuity there, not that it just all of a sudden went like this. You know, there's a hockey stick of violence that there is actually a, a rise, a general rise um, throughout the war. I'm going to have to get my hands on that. I saw that in the back and I've never really, you know, connected the dots, but that sounds like something I would really like to read. So, so, you know, I've had a lot of interest in it. I've actually had a couple people come up to me and during book signings recently with copies of it, I've never signed copies of it. I'd never given a presentation on it. I'd never done anything with it other than publish it. Um, and so uh, I'm actually going to order some copies. It's still in print. So it is 20, cool. 20 years later, it's still in print. So I'm really happy about that. Um, and I'm going to have copies with me. I think I'm going to see you in March because uh, uh, Gene and I are supposed to be down for the Fredericks War, are. Fredericksburg uh, Civil War Roundtable. Um, so we'll pro I'll probably have copies with me then if you want to wait. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I'll wait. I'd rather grab it from you as always. Um, so then we'll talk about that later because I, I think we might need to revisit that book at some point. 
back okay. here. Yeah, if you would, love to, if you would ever I want need, to do a presentation on that, I would love to have you back on to do that. I need to reread it. <laughs> it's, been tw- it's been 20 years. I haven't done anything on the subject. Sure. Um, they're yeah. on my website, which is my name, just my name.com, alexanderrossino.com. Um, I have a uh, list of writings up there and several of my articles that uh, ended up informing uh, Hitler Strikes Poland are up there and you can just download them. I made them, I make them available. They're all PDF okay. if you want, if you're interested in writing any, reading any uh, World War II history. No, for sure. I would be. I actually, I got really into the Battle of the Bulge last year and the Band of Brothers stuff <laughs> that I haven't read before. So I, I finally got into that and I, I'm always looking for something new on World War II that I haven't read yet. And that would be definitely right up my alley. So I think great. Thanks. I'm yeah. going to have to grab a copy of that from you. We'll, we'll revisit that and maybe, <laughs> maybe even do a presentation on next. That would Fantastic. Be, yeah. That would be awesome to do. Uh, read out. Excited every historian in this, on this podcast was saying Band of Brothers. Everyone was like, what? <laughs> you said Band of Brothers. Where's I, Richard Winters? Never heard of it. <laughs> oh, God. Well, I was, I was guilty because up until last year, I've never seen it, nor have I read it. And I watched with my what? Reading. Binge that, yeah, I'm serious. Yeah, last year was the first time I actually sat down, watched the whole thing. Wow. Was like, okay, whoa, well, what did I miss out on? Because I always thought, eh, World War II, somebody else is going to write a book about that. We got it covered. I don't need to read about it. Well, how I was wrong. I was blatantly right. wrong. I have a, I have a stack now of like it's nowhere near my Civil War library, but it's a start. <laughs> Every time I see like some new stuff, I'll, I'll pick it up and give it a whirl. Uh, Readout's a good friend of ours. He should be expecting him on sometime soon. He says, evening gents can only say hi. Looking forward to hearing the recap. Special order when number 191 is one of the wildest turn of events in American history. I'll good probably see years. him tomorrow, to be honest. There you go. MJ yeah, Henyon is also saying, your work has helped bring new thoughts and reassessment on McClellan. So thank you. You're welcome, MJ. We're really, that's really what we're trying to do. You know, we're trying to uh, level the playing field here. There have been too many years where it's just been Steven Sears over and over and over again. And <laughs> his work is just uh, incredibly uh, biased. It's almost like, yeah. it's almost yeah. like he's, you know, uh, Rory Lee and Car- reincarnated, you know, and he's, <laughs> um, and he hates McClellan because he stymied his campaign. <laughs> I'm glad we all, I think there's a mutual feeling of the Sears stuff here. Um, even so when Chance gotta... spoke. go ahead. I got a question. So where do you put on the modern geography that is Frederick, Maryland? Where do you put the finding of Special Orders 191? Right. So this is when it would have been useful to put up a map, but I didn't know I could bring maps and put those up for you. So I'm is not there one I can pull up for you? For you. <laughs> what is there a map I can pull up for you? Because I can put that up. If you'd like. No, I mean, you have to it's in the if you pull if you pick up the book and, you know, and show the show the book, uh, maybe there will be a, co- a copy there. Um, so. Uh, there's a road that runs from there are three major or three roads that run into Frederick from the east and the south. One is the first one from the south is Georgetown Pike all the way up to Mark South Market Street that goes straight through Frederick North. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. The second one is a secondary road that comes from a place called well today it's called Reich's Ford but at that point in time it was called Crumbs Ford. And um, that's called the Iamsville Road because Iamsville is on the other side, the eastern side of the Monocacy River. And that one runs uh, northeast from uh, from the, the Ford up to the intersection of South Franklin Street and East South Street that kind of do this. Um, and then the third one is the National Pike, which comes pretty much directly from the east. So. I believe that the order was found at the intersection or just past the intersection of South Franklin, Iamsville, and South East South Street. Um, and it was found on the left side of that road right there in what used to be a very large uh, hay field or meadow, grassy meadow. Um, and at the point where in, in 1962, that area for from that point, which is 0.47 miles from Frederick, the where frederick was at the time Mm. um that was all open meadow wide open meadow today it's industrial park so you kind of lose a sense of what it was like uh and there or there are houses there you know that kind of thing um and so it was all wide open um and it uh ran also along the bno railroad spur that ran from frederick city down past i down along iamsville road um to uh monocacy junction okay. so that's where i believe it was found and the reason i believe it was found there is that 
the sources, I've got three sources. One is the history of the 27th Indiana, because it was, of course, Corporal Bar Barton Mitchell from the 27th Indiana who found the order. Um, and uh, that says that uh, the 27th Indiana camped in a uh, an open field or open meadow uh, adjoining Frederick. So adjoining means right next to or connected to. It means right beside. So there's no real distance there. We're not talking about a very long distance. The other is uh, a comment that John Bloss, who was the sergeant for the company that was uh, the platoon that was um, that that Barton Mitchell was in, the skirmishers that uh, ran, that came all the way up to Frederick from along the Iamsville Road. Um, Bloss remembered in 1892, so this is 30 years later, but he said that it was in a meadow adjacent to Frederick. So there's another another where adjacent means right next to or beside. Um, and the other source is a man named John Campbell, who was in the, um, I'm sorry, William Hostetter, who was in another company uh, in the reserve skirmish line uh, that uh, 27th Indiana had. And they said that we camped in a meadow uh, uh, on the outskirts or on the city limits of Frederick. So the city limits literally run right through that 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 space right there. So when I put those three, two, three things together, and then I compared them to all the other accounts for 12 core units um, where they said they camped, uh, it became pretty, pretty evident that um, they, that it was somewhere in that, in that region, at least to me in that vicinity. And today there's a small park there called Grove Park and there's a little stone it's funny. There's a little stone monument. You know, this park is dedicated to so and so, whatever. But it's right on the spot where I think the orders were found. So it's almost like it's a marker for where the orders were found. But there's no. But it's not to the orders. It's really bizarre. <laughs> somebody knew something. Yeah. yeah so right. It's, uh, <laughs> well, a good question, Anthony. Yeah. It was a good question. Um, yeah, I want to ask you if you um, you might be familiar with as well. Uh, but how would your work actually fit? into the Maryland campaign. Like uh, that's everything that you've published so far. How does that bring the Maryland campaign together? Um, right. So one of the things that I was trying to do is uh, that I try and do in Calamity at Frederick is to provide the context for in which the orders were developed. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, dis discuss what the impact was of the orders loss and their discovery and some transmission to John, uh, George McClellan um, on that their effect on the campaign. So concerning the context, um, one of the things that Robert E. Lee wrote in his, uh, his in his post uh, battle report or his post campaign report, which wasn't written until August of 1863. So he didn't write it until after the defeat at Gettysburg and had gotten back to Virginia. Um, he said that he thought that his army was, even though it was feeble and transport and, uh, you know, the men were, were shabby looking and things like that, that they actually he thought it was still strong enough to operate or detain the enemy on the northern frontier, what he called the northern frontier, until uh, the year, uh, until enough time had passed that um, the season for active operations would have passed. So that means up, to, up until up until winter, right? right. Um, because Civil War armies tend not to move in winter. Uh, Burnside's attack in, or uh, Fredericksburg action in December is kind of an anomaly, actually, sure. if you... You know, if you consider uh, what most armies did, they usually just hunkered down from December through uh, March, and then they then they pick it up again. Yeah, that whole winter was just discombobulated because you have that happening in the West too with uh, Stones River, Murfreesboro. You know, you have the same thing going on there. Right, too. You're that's right. It was an un unconventional winter for sure. Pressure from the Lincoln administration mm -hmm. too. You know, so um, anyway, so Lee thought that the enemy, which he had just seen him flying in a route before him at the second Manassas, the whole army disintegrated, army of Virginia disintegrated. He thought that it was demoralized and disorganized, to use his words, um, and that uh, they had to incorporate 60,000 new recruits. That was in the newspapers as well that had just arrived in Washington. And he thought that it would take them weeks, if not months, to field a new army that would be effective in the field against him. Okay. Um, so... He's under the impression when he issues his proclamation to the people of Maryland on September 8th that he's got all the time in the world. He can do whatever he wants, go wherever he wants. And it looks like at that point in time, he was planning on going into uh, southern Pennsylvania and uh, raiding and foraging and, you know, just wreaking havoc, basically. Um, 
And then all of a sudden, on the morning of September 8th, he gets two pieces of news. I don't know the order they were received in, um, but I do know that they were received on that day. Uh, one of them was that uh, all of a sudden that there was a feder- actually a strong federal garrison still in place at Harper's Ferry. Um, and that there is that the federal army of the Potomac is moving toward him again from Rockville. So hmm. he's like, oh, uh, I thought I had all this time. Now he doesn't have 48 hours later, he doesn't have the time. Right. So he finds himself in a, in a, in a weird position because he's, his actually is already is actually between two enemy forces. Right. So he needs to take out the weaker one first uh, before he can turn and face the stronger one. Uh, so he develops this plan to uh, seize Harper's Ferry. That's what the special orders number 191 were all about. And then to uh, bring his army back together as paragraph nine in special orders number 191 says, uh, bring them back together between Boonesboro and Hagerstown. At that point in time, he didn't know exactly where he wanted to bring them together. He just looked at the map and said, eh, I want to kind of be in this area, you know, this region. Um, and then afterward, of course, when the orders are found and McClellan ends up moving faster than Lean finds convenient and attacking the South Mountain Gaps, uh, what he ends up doing is he ends up uh, 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 re- ruining Lee's plan because Lee had set a trap for him in a place called Beaver Creek, um, which is almost like the Pipe Creek line in the Gettysburg campaign that Meade wanted to fight at. You know, everyone has their place where they want to fight, but they don't necessarily get to do it the situation doesn't doesn't allow them to do what they want to do so in this case lee had his own position chosen uh it was a stronger position in my belief um, or my you know my my thoughts um or my judgment uh it was a stronger position than the one he ended up taking at sharpsburg Mm -hmm. um but he ended up having to defend the south mountain passes which he never intended to do uh he ended up taking thousands of casualties in the process of doing it Um, His plan for uh, the Beaver Creek position was ruined, and he then ended up having to take a position that was less favorable to his army and bring his army back together uh, in an emergency, which means that marches have to happen where men are coming in on the quick, right? They're, they're They're running, they're basically jogging, and he leaves thousands and thousands of stragglers in uh, Jefferson County, West, what's West Virginia now, but Virginia mm-hmm. then, um, and thousands and thousands of cad- uh, stragglers in his army. So his army ends up become, uh, t- uh, fighting the uh, Battle of Antietam or Sharpsburg, uh, weaker than it would have been if he had been given th- three or four more days uh, to bring it all together. So that's how it kind of fits all together. Okay. Uh, AQ asks an interesting question too. Did any yeah. civilians in 1862 or post-war in your research ever mention Special Order 191? So um, I had to, I, the only civilians, if you want to call them, I mean, I guess they're civilians, of course, are newspaper men. So within 24 hours of the orders having been discovered, there were uh, reports that were already appearing in northern newspapers, the New York Herald, uh, the Washington Evening Star, I think it's called, mm-hmm. um, saying that uh, an order, a special order of Robert E. Lee's had been found outside of Frederick and that had been given to you know the federal commander. Um, the other the other one said, uh, special, they even actually called it Special Order 119. So they got the number you know, they, they transpose a couple of the numbers, but they actually have the number of the order too. So there were some details that were showing up. Um, so yeah, that's, that was the, that, that, those are the two, uh, that I've, you know, the sources that I've found, I haven't found any other civilian sources that, uh, mention it. Okay. Um, MJ is also asking any thoughts on what George McClellan would say if he were able to read your work on him today. <laughs> that's that's Ooh. funny. He'd Ooh. probably say, bully for you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> He'd be proud, man. I, I think so. Boy. Another um, question, if you don't mind, what aspects of the Maryland campaign history do you believe are in need of revision? Um, so, you know, one of them we're obviously working we've already obviously worked on one of them um mm-hmm. and that was you know the fact that george mccollin's army moved much faster uh and at a much uh, more uh uh acceptable to historians pace than you know than people thought um i would also say that uh the role of henry halleck and um lincoln too in the campaign really needs to re- re-examined. Um, I know that Michael Lang has done some work on this uh, in his decisions on the, of the Maryland campaign um, book where um, he says that, you know, Halleck not allowing uh, 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 Dixon Miles to move his garrison from Harper's Ferry actually ruined, you know, Lee's plans and, and created a 
uh, situation that made it impossible for um, McClellan to catch up to Lee. That, absolutely, that's interesting. Um, but the other thing that Halleck did is he's constantly pulling on the reins. He's constantly mm -hmm. telling McClellan, you got to slow down. You can't go far from the Potomac River. Lee's going to cross back over the Potomac River and come south uh, through through Virginia and attack Washington. So that has an effect that needs to be, you know, needs to be reexamined as well. Um, and then finally, I think that uh, the, I think that the, 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 the strength or the the effectiveness of the Army of Northern Virginia at the Battle of Sharpsburg needs to be reexamined because uh, it's it's considered you know most people consider it to be a draw the battle to be a draw um, but I'm I actually don't think it was a tactical draw I think it was a tactical defeat for the Army of Northern Virginia and a lot of that had to do with the fact that um, Lee's lines break multiple times during the day. And yep. they never recover any of the territory or any of the ground that they had lost. No. So even though they've been driven back, they may not have been driven from the field, but they certainly haven't won anything. Right. Um, and then they end up needing, they take you so many casualties, they end up needing to, you know, re retreat across the river the next day. It's exactly like Gettysburg. Yeah. So I think that, um, I think that, uh, you know, Antietam needs to be considered a, a Northern tactical victory or Gettysburg needs to be a draw. Well, you have to make it. You have to pick a lane, one one or the other. It can't be oh, both. A swear word there, <laughs> man. Gettysburg. <laughs> oh, oh God. Uh, I agree with that with yeah. that statement because Lee's fighting for his life. He, he's fighting for his life. <laughs> you mentioned you mentioned the man. I, up, where did you find that picture, Halleck? I made. I have a. I made him. I've got Halleck. Uh, hold on. I got one for you too. I'm sorry, right? Josh. You got up. <laughs> oh, I'm done good. <laughs> I've got these for uh, most of them. Most of the prominent figures we'll talk about tonight. I do have smiling for some reason. Um, of course, you got to have Lincoln smiling too. I know you're drinking tea. Let me not show that while you're drinking the tea. <laughs> That's but, okay. Yeah, you're exactly right. Lee's yeah. fighting for his life at multiple he points. He He's has, shuffling people all over the freaking place. Uh, literally, when the sunken road falls, nobody's there. Yeah. Longstreet's okay. at the Piper Farm firing cannons In because slippers. there's nobody to cover the middle of the line. Yeah, I, I beg your pardon. Francis Barlow destroys the position. In the <laughs> Barlow again. Well, yeah, I mean, you got to give credit where credit's due. He Barlow a, has a very big role in the sunken roads. He captures hundreds of men, Josh. That's, that's people. <laughs> and like, what are you talking yeah. about? I ain't arguing with who broke the line. I said he's fighting <laughs> for his life. I didn't mention Barlow. You forced that one. Yeah. <laughs> AQ must have paid him off. <laughs> oh, no. <Yeah>. Look, <laughs> he does it on his own free will. Oh, no. We've even got a bar. I, I beg to differ. I think that that's the nickname in the entire in the entire Civil War. Fighting Dick Richardson is the one who gets gets through. You just can't push the initiative. I knew Barlow would get brought up somehow. There's not an episode since Anthony and AQ have been back and forth on this. <laughs> yeah, how Barlow dare you hijack my yeah. important statement there with Barlow? Well, I'll follow it up. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna give Burnside a tiny little bit of credit. I, I, I kind of have a little soft spot for old Burnside. His, some of the Ninth Corps guys were actually in the streets of Harrisburg at the end, right before. AP. Nobody saw that coming, neither. Right. And nobody saw AP Hill coming up on his flank like that. No, but to reinforce <laughs> what you said about it being a tactical Northern victory, absolutely. Lee's headquarters. I mean. It's almost feet away, like just from where the Ninth Corps are coming up and actually making their presence in the city of Sharpsburg. It may be the outskirts, and they're, nonetheless, they're there. Tyler, they're in Sharpsburg. That's what I the thought. The Zuwa Monument is yeah. like right above Harper's Ferry Road. They're in Sharpsburg. That's yep. what I thought. Yep. So that that to me reinforces that, dude. I'm glad that you believe that because I have thought the same thing. I'm like, if Lee lets them, not that he lets them, he couldn't stop them. Think nope. E.P. Hill in his What's case that? that this does stop. But What's you're the thing that Lee says when he sees Hill's color guard coming up over the hill? He says something. My um, God, my army's saved or something. Oh, so when uh, when he's he's looking through a, a, a field glass, or he actually he has a, yeah. an artillerist named Ramsey who's uh, he's asking him, you know, point your point your field glass. What flag are they flying? And he's he sees these Zouats and he says they're flying the United States flag. Those are the enemy. And he said, well, um, what about that that column that's coming? 
you know, in this direction. Um, and he says, well, they're flying the Virginia and, uh, and Confederate flags. And then Lee says, that's AP Hill. He's coming. He's, he's finally here from Harper's Ferry. And you have to wonder if Lee would have seen blue jackets uh, among AP Hill's men, because apparently there were so many blue jackets where someone that so many of those uh, Hills guys were wearing blue jackets that, um, there were uh, episodes during the uh, attack, the late afternoon fighting in, at Antietam, where um, federal troops thought that they were firing on their own men, um, oh, wow. but they actually were firing on rebels that were wearing uh, newly captured jackets. I didn't know that. Oh my god! Um, you, quick little you know, jab at Barlow there too. MJ just said Barlow in a Boy Scout <laughs> uniform. <laughs> There's a video series with Ed Bars and Dennis Fry, and they're talking about the Harpers Ferry Road fight. And I was like, what does Ed say? Because everything Bars says is classic. Of course it is. Um, <laughs> AQ's hey, asking up, questions. Oh, um, so this I'm is not a- an expert in this. I can't even answer, either, I can't answer this question. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, AQ. I can't what about go back and rewatch one it. Of the ca- one of the captains in the 61st is killed by a sharpshooter. Captain mm-hmm. Ang- uh, Charlie Fuller talks all about that. Okay. But I don't think Charlie ever mentions anything about Barlow getting shot with a from a sharpshooter. Right. I was about to say you're asking the expert right here to my left. Sixty first, yeah. yeah. The sixty first would have said that um, he was. Was he in proximity to the sixty first? Barlow was in command of the sixty. Command of the sixty first, okay. And sixty fourth, mm-hmm. but yeah. But no, yeah. Charlie Fuller talks about Captain Angel getting shot, but he doesn't talk about Barlow getting shot by a sharpshooter. Hmm. Interesting. So back to calamity too. I have a couple more questions here before we uh, sign off for the night. Um, we we talked a little bit about you know why you took on this project and all. Is there anything else that you feel like you need to add to this after producing these two volumes? Do you think you are good with one ninety one, or is there still something lingering up there that you want to put out? <clears throat> so the only thing I I have is I have some material that didn't make it into the book, which is where I plot out on a map where the units, the red, different regiments say they camped. So, uh, and the 12th course say they camped. So, um, I'm developing an article for my own blog, um, that I'm going to be putting out, which shows my analysis of the, the different spots and why I think they still reinforce, you know, my, um, really my, uh, uh, interpretation of where the orders were found versus the others, uh, say the Myers to Lashmood farm and a, a mile wet away from Frederick. Mm-hmm. Um, so I and this is this is something that's been stimulated again by Gene Thorpe because we go back we go back and forth about this. And he argues that it was a mile away that they were found, and I argue it was only a half a mile from Frederick. Um, and so I just want to take a look at the evidence and present it, you know, to everyone and say this is where this is why I think it is closer. Okay. Um, we have AQ also asking, what are you working on next? So I'm working on getting Guns of September out. Um, the manuscript is finished. Uh, it's been through two rounds of editing, um, and that's because of different editors, not because it's was it's so poorly written that it needed to be so edited so much. Um, but uh, that's we're we're probably going to be finished with that probably in December, and then it'll be out at some point in early 2024 because Sweet. everything else is finished. It's been it's actually been the the manuscript's been done it was a covid casualty um it had been it's been done for so long that uh it was originally dedicated to uh to ted alexander who was oh, a history wow. up here and uh yeah. you know, yep. historian up here yep. in uh chambersburg and uh he passed away a few years ago so it's been done for so long that ted's actually not around with us any longer still Jeez. dedicated to him though good um, and then the final comment here, question wise, and then I'll ask you one to close up since we're talking about the name Ted and Savage. And Ted Alexander, by the way, is a legend. I'm glad that you're dedicating that to him. He absolutely deserves that. He is a legend. Yes, he is. Have you ever thought on writing on John Brown Gordon and his wounding at Antietam? So I actually have written a bit on that. Um, if you look at the essay in uh, the final essay, essay number seven in there, Maryland, mm-hmm. um, I go into gordon and his testimony that you know he held lee's the horses of lee's or uh, reins of lee's horse um and telling him that you know general these men will stay here until uh stay here until dark dark or won't you know won't run etc etc um there is some um 
question whether Gordon actually elaborated on this uh, because there are no other there's no other source that I know of um, that, ta- that that mentions Gordon actually meeting Lee there. But Gordon did say it over and over again. I found a couple of different um, time occasions during um, uh, veterans events after the war that he he told the same story. So it doesn't make it true. It just means that uh, he at least believed in it enough to be telling it over and over again to these veterans. So uh, I have written a little bit on it already. Okay. Interesting. And my last question for you is why would you dedicate this to Ted Savis? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's because Ted, I tend, I tend to write things that sort of buck the mainstream. Um, yeah. And that isn't really on purpose. I, I'm not looking for, I'm not trying to seek, you know, attention or anything like that. Right. It's simply that I read the sources and I'm like this, they say what they say tells me something different than what others have said. They said, um, and Ted always backs me. He always, he's always every, anything I've ever given him. He's like, I love it. Well, let's go with it. So I wanted to give him some acknowledgement that, um, you know, he deserves credit because if Ted doesn't say yes, then none of this gets anywhere. It doesn't right. get out you you don't read it we don't have this conversation people don't talk about it um and you know so he plays a key role in all this stuff and even though he didn't write the book without him it doesn't appear that's that's absolutely right man and ted's like i said he's another one of those legends that we have in the field here and i'm yeah he deserves it you know i mean he he deserves it, it believing in your authors is really important yeah, and Doug Ashton said, I finished reading Calamity of Frederick today. It's a truly great read. Well done. Thanks, Doug. Friend. That was fast. Yeah, Doug is the uh, author of an excellent biography of <laughs> yeah. William Barksdale. Absolutely. Which I know. The I, biography of William Barksdale. I still, I've been meaning to get him on here for that. So, uh, Doug, get in touch with me on Facebook at some point so we can finally talk about that book because I loved it. I, I, I adore that book too. And that was one of the most interesting reads I had because Barksdale is very prominent here in Fredericksburg where I got my start as a historian doing stuff here in town. And of course, I, I, I hone in on Barksdale quite a bit because his river defense there was, you know, some people don't think it was all that important, but I beg to differ on that. That caused a a chain of events in Fredericksburg that still to this day ended up really playing into what happens on December 13. So uh, Bark still does have quite a bit of importance here. And not only that, but second Fredericksburg too. Two of my favorites. I still laugh. I still laugh. Every time I think about Barksdale, I can't help but laugh. I'm um, imagining his toupee flying from his head and went during that fight in Congress that <laughs> Doug wrote about that. That still makes me laugh. <laughs> you know, I, re- I got to read that book while I was working in the Capitol building. Um, so, so to read the, the congressional part of, of Barksdale's history mm-hmm. in the Capitol, because you know, I was reading it during COVID, and there was there were times where I didn't have anything to do. There was no Congress people in the building at all. Um, I was one of the only essential employees running around the Capitol at the time, so I'd sit in the literal rotunda with his book and reading that. And that was oh, that was a awesome. unique experience. I tried yeah, to awesome. find Civil War books that had congressional history in it as well, mm-hmm. because you can't do Civil War and Congress, but they they go hand in hand. So to have that oh, one, yeah. that was that was awesome. Uh, he says Scott Hartwig. Also has great compliments on Barksdale and his new yep. book. Barksdale inflicted does. the most uh, casualties on um, federal forces during the Battle of Antietam. That's what uh, that's what he says. All righty. Well, do you have anything else, Alex, before we sit here and hop off? Um, no, I think that's it. Thanks very much for having me. I really appreciate it, gentlemen. And uh, keep keep on keeping on. Absolutely. Yeah, well, always- I'm always just listening and learning. Yeah, and you're always welcome back on. We're gonna, like I guess, we're gonna talk about that book about Hitler Strikes Poland and also when um, the new Antietam uh, fiction comes out I'm going to be reading that immediately as it comes out and then I'm going to want to bring you back on to talk about those two Um, so I think we have two more episodes left to do with you so and keep writing stuff we'll just keep having you back on just come on thanks I appreciate it absolutely (laughs) you're you're one of my favorites to have on here man well everybody at home that has listened to and joined in live thank you guys so much if you didn't get to catch this live Just go over to Spotify tomorrow morning. This will be up as a podcast to listen to on your commute. If you get to sit in traffic like I do, it's kind of a cool way to uh, spend your traffic commute. Uh, Just put on a good podcast and listen. Thank you guys so much for joining. Alex, again, thank you so much for being here tonight and doing what you do. Absolutely. We will see you guys on the next.